As John said, we welcome everyone to our services today. We're thankful that you've chosen to tune in with us wherever you are. There's a wonderful passage in the scripture that says, In the fullness of time, God sent his Son into the world. The fullness of time means at just the right time. And while we're grateful for that gr tremendous blessing that took place 2,000 years ago, all of us are wondering these days when the right time will be for us to gather together again. I listened to Lester Holt on the NBC News the other night, and he was talking about a poll that had been taken that revealed some 80% of Americans said that despite different states and different localities uh, reopening back to regular commerce, that those people would not be willing to go to places where there are large crowds gathered. So we have to understand that we didn't get into this situation overnight, and we're not likely to get out of it overnight, but we're prayerful and hopeful that not too very much in the distant future we'll be able to gather together again as God's people under one roof and in one place. The text before us today is taken from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his great and precious promises. It's been estimated that there are some 7,000 promises found in God's word. We recognize that our Heavenly Father is a God who makes promises, and He is a God who keeps them. From the certainty of God's promises, we can have confidence. And again, is that something that would characterize our nation, our society, our world right now, that we're confident? Most people don't have any kind of confidence these days. The United States just passed the 50,000 mark of deaths due to the coronavirus. Our economy is shutting down with unemployment at record levels. People are afraid. They're anxious. They're uncertain of what tomorrow holds. And yet at a time like this, we can talk about confidence and the hope and trust that we have. Yes, we can, because our confidence is not nor was it ever in current events or in the circumstances or situations we find ourselves in, that confidence has always been rooted and grounded in the character of God himself. We recognize that we have this anchor as a hope, as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And that anchor is not the way things are going right now. The anchor is the character and person and integrity of God. As God's people, our hope has always been built on the truth and dependability of the God who makes and keeps the very precious promises we read about in Scripture. Now, the Bible is filled with such promises, and we can't obviously cover 7,000 of them. But for the next few minutes, join with me, if you will, as we consider very carefully 10 of these very great and precious promises that continue to transform our world and ourselves. Promise number one, God had always pointed to the fact that there would be a coming Messiah. In Isaiah 9 and verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This promise, revealed through God's servant Isaiah, was mentioned 700 years before Jesus was born of Mary in Bethlehem. How can you make a promise 700 years before the event actually comes to fruition? Well, because God foretells the future the same way that we can look at the past. God understands that the future indeed is in his hands. It's been suggested that everything in the Old Testament points to the coming arrival of this Messiah, 
Everything in the New Testament looks back to the birth of Jesus, to his life, to his ministry, to his death, burial, and resurrection. The greatest promise we have received is the promise that a Messiah was coming that would save the people from their sins. And we give thanks to the fact that Jesus is that Messiah. A second promise is that of an eternal kingdom. As we mentioned, God can tell the future uh, as easily as we can notice what's going on around us in the present. In Daniel 2 and verse 44, a prophecy is made of the history that God's people will find themselves in. It says, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. As Daniel is giving this prophecy to Nebuchadnezzar, he is making a note of which several things that are almost too impossible to believe. As he gives the reckoning of the image that takes place, he is picturing four kingdoms or four empires that the world will see on its stage. The Babylonian Empire, followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the Greek Empire, and finally followed by the Roman Empire. And they will get progressively stronger. And yet, Daniel says that in the days of those kings, of the Roman kings or emperors, that God would set up another kingdom, that would bring those kingdoms to an end. And that kingdom, of course, is his church. We stand here today 2,000 years later recognizing that the church is still alive and well, even as those other kingdoms litter the dustbin of history. The church will outlive and outlast every kingdom, every empire, and every nation. What a blessing it is to belong to that church. Promise number three is that God gives us his unstoppable word. In Isaiah 55, the scripture tells, As the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You realize that that saving message of God's word continues to change and transform lives today. The Hebrews writer says in chapter 4 and verse 12 of that book that the word of God is living and active. And I've seen that again and again in four decades of preaching. I can't tell you how many times someone has come up to me and said, Brother Chuck, I can't believe that you knew exactly what to say today, exactly what to preach today, because this is what's going on in my life. This is a problem that we're struggling with, and you knew exactly the right thing to say. And I always feign ignorance then. I feign ignorance a lot of the time, but especially then. I'm not clairvoyant. I don't know exactly what to say, but here's the issue. When you preach this living word, it's going to go to work on the human heart. God has the answers for your problems and for mine, for everyone's, because this word is not like any other word that's ever been sounded forth. Promise number four, God tells us that there will be a constant care that he will take in our lives. Jesus says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your Father in heaven knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. When all of this pandemic started and people were making a mad rush on the grocery stores, There was something that a lot of Americans had probably not remembered seeing, maybe in their entire lifetimes, maybe at least going back several decades, and that was the sight of empty grocery shelves. We don't see that kind of thing in America. That's almost incomprehensible. And yet, those things have been dealt with week by week, 
But there are still some things that grocers are running short of. And you know, if Walmart's running short of it, then probably everyone is running short of it. But here's something to ponder. Jesus tells us that God will make sure that we have food and clothing, something to eat, something to drink, the necessities of life. Do you have them today? Are you lacking in any of those things? Are you hungry right now? Most of us probably have been looking at this in reverse. We've probably been eating more these days than we would in normal days. I would suggest that in the West, at least, in America, we have probably more of an issue with hoarding than we do with starving. That reminds us that God's promise to take care of us stands firm and secure. Promise number five. God guarantees that we will have with him an avenue of communication. John 15 and verse 7 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Is this a time to forego the great blessing of prayer? Or is it not a time to double down and pray even more than we ever have before? I was listening to a song the other day by George Jones, that late great country music singer, The Possum. It was a song I'd never heard before. The title was A Picture of Me Without You. And this is what Jones said in the opening lines of the song. Imagine a world where no music was playing. And think of a church with nobody praying. And I thought, how fitting for the times in which we live. There is church building after church building, sitting empty, shuttered, locked up tight, and where no one is praying. And yet, you think that the church is not praying? You think that people all over our great country are not praying? I would suggest that there might be more praying going on these days than there ever has been before, because we're reminded that we are not in control of all the things that we see. We're not the captain of our own salvation. And thanks be to God that he has provided the avenue of prayer. How unlikely is it that the creator of the universe would care what you think and what I think, what's on our hearts, and yet he does, because of this great and precious promise of an avenue of communication. The sixth promise is the abundant life. In John 10 and verse 10, Jesus says that he came to have, that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Do you feel right now as if you're living the abundant life? Most of us are spending our time wringing our hands, looking for things to do because we can't go out and do all the things that we've enjoyed doing most of our lives. And it's bringing people down. I'm not trying to minimize that at all. It's been something we've all had to deal with. It's all something that we have to adjust to. And yet, we have friends. We have family. We have food to eat. We have houses to live in. We have transportation to get where we can go to, you know, if we're allowed to go. We have things to watch on television. We don't have any sports. That's a, that's a problem. We have books to read. Here's the greatest thing of all, though. We have a Father in heaven who loves us, and we have a Savior who died for us. Do we have the abundant life? Yeah, we do. We might not have all the things we've had for the earlier days in our lives, and yet right now, we still have pretty abundant lives. Thanks be to Jesus. Promise number seven is that God would give us a true freedom. The Lord says in John chapter eight, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do people today know the teachings of Jesus? Are they holding to those teachings? Do they see any connection between the teachings of Jesus on the one hand and true freedom on the other? Probably not, because so many people envision freedom 
having nothing to do with God. Freedom, in fact, is something that you enjoy once you get away from God. Then you're free to do anything that you want to do. But is that true freedom? Or in fact, is that not another form of slavery? The sage of Baltimore, H.L. Mencken, made a very caustic but very true observation. He said, the average man is not that concerned about being free. The average man is concerned about being safe. And right now, we don't feel all that free or all that safe in America and in the world. You know why? Because we have forgotten that true freedom is tied and connected to Jesus himself. Number eight, God gives us the promise that we will enjoy a perfect forgiveness The very first time the gospel of Jesus was preached, on Pentecost in Jerusalem, Peter gives this invitation, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. If you want to enjoy forgiveness of sins, recognize this. Faith begins by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have to believe in God. We have to believe that Jesus is God's son. We have to be willing to confess that before our fellow man. We have to be willing to recognize the presence of sin in our lives and to repent of that sin. And we have to be willing to join Jesus in the watery grave of baptism. Some today say, well, why does baptism even matter? Why do we need that? You tell me, is it not compelling to you to recognize that the very first time the gospel was preached, this is what people were commanded to do? I'd like to know over the course of 2,000 years what has changed. We have the same God. We have the same Jesus. We have the same problem, the problem of sin. And we have the same solution, obedience to his gospel. You might be out there watching this message right now, and you have not yet taken that step to be baptized into Christ. I would simply pose a question to you. Why not? What are you waiting on? What better time than today, than now, to obey God and to put Jesus on in baptism? Why in the world? Would you take that promise of a perfect forgiveness and just shove it aside to make your own way? That doesn't make any sense. Number nine, God gives us the promise of a reason to persevere. In Romans 8, 28, there is this promise. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to to his purpose. Some make mincemeat of this passage. They say, well, see, that says all things are good. No, all things are not good. This virus is not good. This pandemic is not good. It's not good that people's lives are being thrown into turmoil, that lives are being lost, that jobs are being lost. These are terrible things. And yet there is this promise of Romans 8.28, And that is that God and God alone is capable of bringing good out of bad situations. It doesn't say that the situations themselves are good, but it says God can bring good out of them. Look around you right now. Can you see any hidden blessings in this time in which we're living? People are slowing down. That's a blessing. People are getting out of the rat race for a while. That's a blessing. People are eating meals with their families. Uh, They're going in and discovering that new room in the house called a kitchen and that appliance called a stove. Or maybe you're like the the one fellow that said every time that mom would say, kids, time to eat, uh, you'd go get your coat and go to the garage and get in the car. Well, we're getting away from that. That's probably a good thing. People are having time to read. Time to listen to music, time to walk, time to exercise, time to do yard work. 
basically time to be together again. God can bring good out of bad. He always has, and he continues to promise to do that even today. And finally, promise number 10. The Lord promises us an eternal home if we have cast our lot with him. In John chapter 14, Jesus comforts his disciples with these familiar words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is a promise that has brought people through difficult times for 2,000 years. And it continues to bring hope to the troubled soul even today. But notice, that promise is for those who belong to the Lord. It's not just a universal promise. The Lord's not going to compel anyone to follow him who chooses to go another way. And yet, without Jesus as the centerpiece of your life, you have no hope to look into the abyss of the future. Just this week, I finished a scintillating biography about Ted Williams called The Kid, The Immortal Life of Ted Williams by Ben Bradley Jr. I find it really sad that if people know anything about Ted Williams today, it's usually two things. Number one, he was the greatest hitter that the major leagues have likely ever produced. Number two, his remains are frozen in the Alcor Cryogenics Facility in Scottsdale, Arizona. That is a sordid, depressing tale to read about. I couldn't wait until those chapters were done because I already knew a little bit of the story. But here's where this came about. Williams' son, John Henry Williams, big, tall, strapping, good-looking kid, didn't believe in God. He considered himself to be an atheist. And as he saw his father slipping away from him, he was desperate to find some way where they could remain together forever. Now, God was out of the picture. He didn't exist. Jesus, according to John Henry Williams, didn't matter. So he became fascinated by cryonics, the idea that after we die, we can be frozen, and then when there are discoveries that will come down the pike, that we could be reanimated and live forever. Now, when most people hear that, they think, what are you, crazy? That's exactly what I thought the first time that I heard that. But Williams was talking to his then-girlfriend, and this is what he said. He said, when I die, I'm not going to heaven. I'm going to Alcor. So you'll pick that over the God of all creation. You'll pick being frozen in some kind of chemical stew over trusting in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But here's why that makes a little bit of sense. If you take God out of the picture, that's the kind of nonsense that you're going to chase. Friends, without Jesus, there is no future. Without Jesus, there is no life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Do you have that promise that Jesus is your Savior and that he will be your advocate at the judgment? That's the greatest assurance that any human being can entertain. The great songwriter Isaac Watts said this, Happy the man whose hopes rely on Israel's God. He made the sky and earth and seas with all their train. His truth stands forever secure. He saves the oppressed. He feeds the poor and none shall find his promise vain. My friend, know this. God is a God who makes promises. And more important, God is a God who keeps promises. You can stake your life and your eternity on that.
Let's go to him in prayer. Our Father, we take all the hope and all the assurance in the world because of your character, because of your trustworthiness, because of your love and mercy. And Father, we know that there have been so many promises that you have made that have already come to pass. And Father, the ones that have yet to come to pass, they will in the future. And Father, we believe that. We build our very lives on your trustworthiness. And Father, we stake our futures and our eternity on the fact that you can be believed. Father, help us to grow in that belief each passing day. Father, because of Jesus, we have this confidence. and We offer this prayer in his name.